we will apply the concepts of inverse functions to the sine, cosine, and tangent functions. Here's the extended chart of values for these functions. We have put it into a chart instead of an arrow diagram to save space, but the information is still the same. Let's take a moment to focus on the sine chart. Remember that the inverse asks the question, given an output value, what input value could it have come from? We'll focus on a specific value. If sine of theta is equal to square root of 3 over 2, then what can we know about theta? By looking at the chart, we can see that pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3 are both possible values of theta. But because of the periodicity of the sine function, we know that if we add or subtract multiples of 2 pi to these, we will get even more values. This means that the inverse isn't going to be a function unless we restrict the range. In this case, it turns out that the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 is the natural choice. So when we ask what is the inverse sine of the square root of 3 over 2, the answer will be pi over 3. We can look at the cosine and tangent charts in the same way. When looking at the cosine chart, the interval of 0 to pi turns out to be the most natural range to pick. For the tangent function, we restrict ourselves to the open interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We have grayed out a couple values from the tangent function because they aren't actually defined at plus or minus pi over 2, but those endpoints are still important values to know. To get the inverse functions, we simply swap the rows in our restricted charts. We could also rearrange the rows to put the x values in increasing order, but we'll leave it in this form for now. Let's look at this graphically. This is the graph of the sine function. Recall that the graph of the inverse is the graph that we get when we reflect across the line y equals x. This will result in a curve that vibrates left and right as it goes up the y-axis. Notice that this fails the vertical line test, so it's not a function. But by restricting the range to the interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, we get a graph that does represent a function. This is the same effect as restricting the chart of values from earlier. Looking at the cosine function, we see that the inverse has the same back and forth behavior as a sine function, so we will also need to restrict the range. From the picture, it makes a little more intuitive sense why we pick the range as we do. It has to do with finding a piece of the graph that can pass the vertical line test. There are other pieces that we could have picked, but notice how those values end up being further away from the origin or negative. So the choice of the range of the inverse cosine is in this sense the natural choice. The inverse tangent function is different because it extends from negative to positive infinity. We still have the problem of repeated values, so we will restrict the inverse to just the connected piece that passes through the origin. The important idea to get out of this video is that all of these steps are really trying to define a function that can answer the question, given an output value, what input value could it have come from? If you keep focused on this question, you will find inverse functions to be less confusing. In the next video, we're going to look at a geometric interpretation of the inverse trigonometric functions.